Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation on Innovation and in Education Lightning Talks. My name is Shanika Hope. I serve as Head of Content and Research with a program called AWS Educate. With that specific program, I have the opportunity of developing academic programs that are designed to accelerate the development of technical talent, diverse technical talent, with educational institutions all over the globe. So what that means is I work with faculty, education leaders, policy, government, state leaders that are focused on this idea of how do we accelerate innovation in higher education. And so today, we want to dive deep and better understand this idea of innovation in higher education. Now, innovation is a topic that's coming up. It's a very popular topic that's happening, that's in the conversation of the higher education leadership and faculty really all over the globe. But what we're finding is that innovation looks and sounds and feels different depending on the institution. There are a number of factors that influence and impact how an institution thinks about innovation. And so what we're hoping to do together today is to better understand how three different institutions are beginning to tackle this idea of innovation. Now you may be thinking, well, why is innovation such a big, big deal within the higher education space? It's primarily driven by a number of factors. The need to amplify or change or adjust the value proposition of the institution. It's the idea to, to grow and to expand. It may be connected to revenue models. There are a number of factors that drive institutions to grapple with this idea of innovation, but it's a necessary thing that has to be discussed and purposefully planned for as we, as an institution, thinks about their overall strategy and where they see themselves three years, five years, ten years from today. So I have the pleasure of being joined by three innovative leaders who are leading the charge of innovation in their parts of the world at their respective institutions. And so today you'll get the opportunity to hear each of them dive deep and talk about the parts of innovation that, and how they're driving innovation within their respective, uh, or their respective colleges or universities at their respective institutions. So without further ado, I'll quickly introduce who they are. They're going to give you a little more information about the work that they lead every day as part of their lightning talk. So I'm joined today by Kim Karras. Kim serves as the Senior Associate Director at Northwestern University for the Masters of Science Artificial Intelligence program. What that means is that Kim has the opportunity of overseeing all of the educational planning, the business administration factors for the, the McCormick's Masters of Science and Artificial <coughs> Intelligence program. She gets the fun opportunity of managing the day-to-day -day operations and leads the initiatives surrounding corporate engagement, this idea of outreach, and industry relations. So that's Kim. Seated beside Kim is Noah Gift. Noah lectures at Duke MIDS Graduate Data Science Program and a host of other schools, including UC Berkeley, Northwestern, UC Davis, and UNC Charlotte. Noah teaches and designs graduate machine learning, AI, data science courses, and he serves as a, and consults um, with faculty and students on machine learning and cloud architecture. So we're gonna learn more about the work that Noah engages with, not just at his work with Duke, but really with a number of institutions around the US and maybe internationally, I'm not sure, we'll find out. Seated beside Noah, we have Kyle Collins. Kyle serves as the Assistant Vice President of Technology Transformation with St. Louis University. Kyle, in his work, he focuses on strategic planning and innovation initiatives related to technology for the university. He focuses on four real key areas, including IT relationship management, IT project office, the clinical reporting team, and the technology innovation academic technology commons team. That's a mouthful. We'll learn more about the work that Kyle leads as part of his lightning talk as well. So without further ado, we'll turn it over to Kim. Thank you. Thank you so Absolutely. much, Dr. Hope. We really appreciate it. Um, first of all, thank you for having us here, Northwestern Engineering. We're excited about it. Um, we were actually the first AI program to 
offer these uh, types of curriculum in the market. So we're really happy that we've kind of gained momentum. We're going to talk a little bit about the partnerships and kind of how we bring the innovation to our students and what we look for and how the program is shaped. Um, I'll get into more about how we're working with AWS, but I want to let you know a little bit more about the actual program. So we first launched in 2018. We uh, admitted our first batch of uh, 20, 19, 20 students, and we're happy to report that they graduate next week and 90% of them already have job opportunities. The others are kind of just being picky and waiting it out to see what they really want to do. Um, the coursework in AI is really human-computer interaction. We dive deep into machine learning, deep learning, computer vision, and other technologies that support AI. Um, we really want to make sure that our students master this. It's a 15-month program, so students really move very quickly through the curriculum, and there's not a lot of time to meander and linger on marginal topics. So we really dive into the in the weeds to make sure that students are developing these skill sets to help them move forward quickly. Um, we, what we feel is very special about our program is that not only is it academic and it's theory-based, but we bring that innovation in and we make sure that our students are introduced to industry really quickly. We have a very deep partnership program where we introduce students to various verticals and various industries to make sure that they understand what's out there for them because some may come in wanting professional services or um, management consulting, and then they find out that healthcare has a whole wealth of AI and machine learning, so we introduce them to the different verticals that help support their professional goals. Um, I already mentioned that we have graduates that are coming out next week and are really proud. We just admitted our second cohort of students, so we're happy to move them along as well. So I want to show you a little bit more about who our students are. So we have this initiative that we, we've coined CS plus X, and the X inch equals any industry that's there, whether it's um, linguistics or any type of humanities or law or medicine. So obviously we all know here that technology touches every industry. So we look for people who have the technology background. So if you know how to code, that's pretty much the common thread. Python is the one that we use mostly coming in. But if, if you can see how the demographic breakdown is by major where our students come in, you see a lot come in with computer science backgrounds, computer engineering, but we welcome all backgrounds because we want to make sure that um, AI touches every industry and that we're, we're grooming professionals that basically have that skill set. Um, this is what the work experience looks like. So. We want people that have professional experience. We look for at least two years of experience, um, but we're a full-time daytime program, so a lot of the times the professionals aren't necessarily looking for a full-time daytime program. So this is what it looks like for our students. The majority are coming right out of undergraduate, but we do have some that basically quit their lives for 15 months to come back, uh, go to school, learn this skill set, and as our graduates that are coming out right now are doing, they're hitting the market with their new skill set. And this is the gender breakdown. And we already know that we need more female programmers and people in computer science, but we're starting to balance it out a little bit more. We have more in the cohort this year than we did last year, so we're hoping that as our program continues to mature that we'll gain momentum in terms of the gender breakdown, and hopefully we'll have it equal out very, very soon. So this is what I want to talk a little bit more about as to, in terms of what students actually learn. So I mentioned that it's a 15-month program. So the first quarter, students come in and they learn the supporting technologies. Um, they get an introduction to artificial intelligence. It's a very heavy Python programming um, course, actually the whole program is. Um, they'll take classes such as a, demo, a database seminar course that really introduces them to working with large data sets as we know that it all starts with the data. Uh, then we move along to uh, expanding on their learning to knowledge rep representation, um, computer, hum computer human interaction, uh, which is more of the design piece, natural language processing or natural language generation because you obviously have to know language and know about that. We move on to the spring quarter where there's really only one core course and that's the practicum. And this is where we've already started introducing our students to industry and now they take a practicum where they actually put their skills that they're learning to practice where they're working with industry, real data, real problems, designing real AI, ML solutions. Um, but they also are able to take their own electives that are designed to help with their career trajectory so they're able to focus on um, computer vision or if they want to go into robotics or something of that nature. I don't have a summer quarter section on there because that's when students are gone. They move from their practicum, now they move to their internship, 
where they're actually working full time for a company and basically learning how to work, communicate, meet deadlines, timelines, work with people, good, bad, or indifferent, and then they actually come back for their final quarter where they dive into their practicum, I'm sorry, their capstone, which is where it's a larger scale project, where now they're spending, instead of one half of their time on a practicum project, now they're spending three quarters to almost all of their time working on a real problem, taking a use case that's supplied by one of our partners and being able to really work that through to fruition. We're happy that some of our students have seamlessly moved from their pra practicum internship and onto their uh, practicum, I'm sorry, their capstone to full-time employment with their, their sponsoring company. So now let's talk a little bit about how students integrate the technology that they learn about. So I mentioned how we partnered with AWS and we've had solutions architects come out. We've done the Deep Racer um, challenge. We've done a different type of challenge where students actually created some of the different um, ideas that they had where they followed it through for, to fruition. We did the robot car rally. If any of you have already seen the Deep Racer, it was super fun where students calibrated the cars, they used the data, they trained it, and then they raced it, and then we had winners. Um, and the, the results was that we had this great competition and they won like a deep lens um, and different fun things. Then we had a second hackathon that came about where we had teams compete with their own ideas and we're happy that we had a really cool team that actually created um, and I'll tell you about that in a second, but they use Lambda and Poly and recognition, and they really use these different types of, of, of services and tools from AWS to be able to, to roll this out. So um, the, the team that actually won created uh, an app for the cell phone that if you're hearing impaired, my mic just went dead, there it goes. If you're hearing impaired or visually impaired, it spoke to what was around you. So it, had, it said computer monitor, computer keyboard, and it was really quite cool. So they won, and it was pretty fantastic. So I hope that my videos work because, there we go, we didn't test them. So this was the RoboCar Rally, and if you guys have seen the Deep Racer, racer this is what students did. We had a fantastic time. Um, Todd Escalona and his team came out, and they created these cars, and it was very, very fun. Then the next, we had the, uh, the hackathon where students, this was the ideation session where they came up with their ideas um, and they were able to put out some really fun projects at the end of our all day long hackathon. So it was quite fun and we really enjoyed it. So this is just a smattering of some of the partners that we actually work with. Um, we make sure that when students start in the fall, we have a professional speaker series where speakers come out, uh, they talk about the problems they've see, they see, they talk about the types of solutions that they've put into place, they talk about the talent that they need, they talk about the things that they want to do to move it forward, and these are some of the companies that we actually work with. So the partner program, our, our partners can actually collaborate with us in a few different ways. Either A, they can come out and speak and talk about their projects, they can B, they can provide um, practicum projects for students to work on. If they don't have data that they're able to provide us, then they can work with us through internships, or they can even work with us through job placement when students are ready to come out, which is a great platform to, to try to help um, deliver. So that's the Northwestern Engineering Program, and thank you for listening, and I'll pass it along to my colleague. All right. Hi, happy to be here. Thank, thank you. you again for uh, very interesting uh, insight there. Uh, yeah, my name is Noah Gift, and I have some uh, really interesting ideas, hopefully, to you about uh, solving this cloud skills uh, problem and uh, just a little bit of, of my background is that I am not coming from a maybe a traditional um, educational background and that I worked I'll call it a tour of duty in San Francisco for 10 years and uh, I've kind of wrapped that up and moved to the East Coast and one of the things that I've noticed is that there it does appear to be this jobs and education mismatch when I was in San Francisco uh, often, you know, I would start with, uh, you know, learning Python, then then I had to learn uh, iOS development, then I'd have to learn, you know, Erlang, and then Haskell, and the C Sharp, and there's this, like, treadmill that you learn as a developer that isn't exactly the same that you get in the traditional educational system. And I happen to get degrees at the same time, and I'd, I'd kind of, you know, merge those two things. And one of the things that we're seeing is that four out of the last ten college graduates were, were, were actually not, uh, the degree they got wasn't actually helpful in them getting a job. So w what that tells me is that you're getting trained on the wrong thing, uh, many of these students. And then if you look at student debt, 
where student debt's at an all-time high, $1.4 trillion. Just in the last 10 years, you can see that, in fact, you've got, you know, student debt has, has, has doubled. So there's something going on here that the marketplace is going to have, have to make an adjustment uh, for. And so one of the things that I've seen, is, and, and this is kind of a common, um, you know, saying is that, you know, every company is a software company, especially in the Bay Area, every company is a software company. Well, where does the software run? Well, it runs in the cloud. And so uh, that's one of the things that uh, companies are starting to realize that they need. And this, this is going to tie into some of the stuff I'm going to talk about later. But even traditional um, you know, graduate degrees at very elite universities, uh, they also need some of that uh, certification sprinkled inside of there. And uh, one of the things that I've done uh, is, is kind of did a little bit of research on what is the current crisis that we're having in terms of trying to find uh, talent in the cloud. And a recent survey shows that 94% of organizations are, are having trouble finding uh, you know, cloud talent. So basically, there's a, there's a pervasive crisis uh, amongst companies trying to find talent. I'm sure you know, people here have seen the same thing. And, and then if you look at even companies that you wouldn't necessarily think are you know, very um, motivated uh, you know, towards uh, you know, trying to do things outside of just profit, but comp like, for example, uh, Jamie Dimon is starting to look at things like stakeholders, right? Who are all the stakeholders? And in fact, maybe my own employees are stakeholders, and I need to do things to help them out. And in fact, this idea of of us having, you know, as a you know, as a CEO, investing in your employee, in your employee, and, and trying to figure out a way to help them out, I think is now becoming like also a crisis point. And in fact, I think Harvard Business School just recently talked about the need for a chief, um, uh, ta what is it, a training officer, where where you're reinvesting in employees. Uh, in your own company. And so one of the ways that we've done this uh, at some of the universities I've worked at is that we used AWS certification as, we, we made it like a club. So uh, MSBA is a, is a pretty hot degree right now, uh, but in addition to just getting the, you know, the you know, machine learning and, and data science uh, you know, curriculum, we're also sprinkling in those students getting certified on AWS. And I think in last year, we had close to 75% of the UC Davis class get certified on cloud practitioner. Some of them went on and got the machine learning certification, and it's been a game changer. In fact, I've had students come to me, email me, and say, listen, like, I'm so glad you told me. I was very skeptical of, you know, that I needed to get this additional training, but it turns out that I got a job just because I had this AWS certification. So the, to me, the combo, I, I call this the triple threat, is that you have a, a graduate degree, you have uh, a certification, you have a portfolio, that's triple threat. If you get all three of those things, you're in, you're in good shape uh, because very few people have those things. And uh, another thing I've done in the Northwestern program and also uh, with UC Davis is, is start to work with AWS Educate and they're you know, super helpful people and we, we've been able to, to ad hoc take pieces of the AWS uh, you know, education ecosystem like the Deep Lens or, you know, like in the other example, the Deep Racer, like take those in and put them into graduate level courses. In fact, the, the graduate students themselves are, who are super motivated, uh, talented people are telling, they're telling us, they're, they're coming back and saying, look, I need to know more cloud, I need to know more cloud. And I think this is one of the things that we're seeing is that it's almost like a, you know, like it's a performance enhancing substance, you know, it's like it, it helps everything a little bit when you, when you put cloud curriculum into a program. And another thing that uh, I've, I've found out as well is that you know, there's a lot of ways that you can solve this cloud uh, talent uh, problem. One of them is that you can, I would say, any degree, period, liberal arts degree, music degree, business degree, why would you not also you know, teach them something like a cloud certification? Be and, and I think other people have mentioned this, but a lot of the companies I talk with and and hiring managers, if you ask them some of the things that they're they're you know missing in 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 the um, in the in the job search, is that someone doesn't have soft skills or communication skills or uh, you know the ability to write something very succinctly and present it. And it turns out that if you have uh, maybe a communication degree or you have a, a writing degree and you combo that with a little bit of data science and then also maybe a AWS certification, that's a pretty powerful 
uh, resume. And I think that's one of the things that's interesting is if you're creative, you can solve this uh, cloud talent problem. And also, uh, just by integrating these things like uh, AWS Educate in a program, it just kind of enhances everything. And then also, educating em companies as well about how important it is that they are encouraging their employees to get cloud certified or get cloud training and, and to have this constant process of, of you know, setting lifelong learning goals. So in a nutshell, I would say that, uh, and then finally, the last thing I want to mention is that one of the things that I personally am a huge fan of is as someone who escaped the, the Bay Area is that there are lots of talented people everywhere and there's lots of low cost regions, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia, and you can see that AWS is coming in there helping out those regions. I think that's another no brainer way to scale a talent is there's talent everywhere. They just need access to the right material. Great, thank you, Next. Noah. Thank you, Noah. Thanks. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get up and move around a little bit, I apologize, um, but I can't see the slides from over there. Um, so uh, I'm Kyle Collins, I'm with uh, St. Louis University. I'm part of the IT department uh, at the university. St. Louis University is a private uh, Catholic Jesuit university located in Midtown St. Louis, Missouri. Um, we, we are the oldest university west of the Mississippi and just started our third century of educating students, um, supporting life-changing research, and providing compassionate healthcare to our, uh, our community. So um, in order for the IT department to, uh, to support those three key missions for the university, we've really taken, uh, undertaken a transformation over the last three years to commoditize our core IT services, uh, lower the cost of delivering them and kind of standardize them and, and make them more repeatable so that we're able to put and focus more resources towards growth and innovation, uh, again, to help support the university across all of its missions. Um, uh, in, in doing that, um, we have, we've really taken on a, a somewhat different uh, approach to innovation. So we try to rapidly look at new technologies and evaluate them for their usefulness or their, their potential impact. Um, we do that through proof of concepts. Um, we review the technologies quickly. We involve our stakeholders in that, um, in that process. And then we select ones to, to uh, um, put into production and, and take forward as projects. And so the, uh, the Alexa at SLU program is a good example of, of how we approach um, innovation uh, in, in, in our environment. Okay, make sure you get out there and do some of this stuff on campus. I will, I will. Hey. Alexa, ask SLU what's happening on campus tonight. Ask SLU who the Billikens are playing tonight. Ask SLU where the student center is. Alexa, call mom. Is Quizify even a real word? Ask Lou when the library opens. Alexa. Yes. Ask Lou when student health opens. Alexa, where can I order pizza from? How long can pizza stay out? Play a guided meditation. What's the atomic weight of mercury? Ask Lou to call career services. Ask Slu how I changed my address. Alexa, ask Slu what time commencement starts today. The 2022 commencement ceremony starts at 9 a.m. Congratulations, Billiken. So that's a that's a marketing video. I'd love to take credit for that, but we have some really brilliant people that that helped us do that. Um, and so, uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the program of how we got involved with Alexa uh, at SLU. So um, Alexa's freshman year, 
uh, Alexa joined St. Louis University last year, fall 2018. Uh, we, we really brought her in with one idea in mind, and that was to help incoming freshmen in particular get connected to campus um, by giving them quick access to information they would need to get engaged, um, get around campus, um, and get involved in things. Um, so getting from where we were in early spring to, to having them in the, uh, available in August, we undertook a four-week proof of concept uh, where we brought different devices in, um, gave them to students uh, to, to evaluate kind of the usefulness of digital voice assistance on campus uh, and to the students. We still at that point weren't really sure what we were gonna do. And so we got a lot of feedback from the students, um, pretty good feedback overall, uh, helped us select uh, the Alexa platform. And so from that point, we started kicking around ideas about how to, how to approach this. And from the point we actually settled on, we're gonna put a, an Alexa device in every res hall room on campus to actually implementing and having an Alexa device in there uh, in every res hall uh, room on campus was about three months. So we ordered the devices, branded the devices, uh, worked with partners to create our basic skill. Um, and when, when fall started, we had a device in every res hall room. Uh, it answered about 130 questions specific to SLU. It also had about 45 uh, phone book entries. So while they couldn't call, uh, they couldn't call mom by mom. They could actually dial mom if, if they wanted to call out the number. But they could say things like, Alexa, call the registrar. Um, so uh, additionally, they had access to kind of the underlying basic set of Alexa skills, you know, not basic knowledge questions, uh, reminders, notifications, uh, streaming music, as long as it wasn't specific to like Pandora or uh, Spotify. Um, and uh, we, we saw a really good adoption. So we saw, uh, over the, the first year, we saw 150,000 uses of the devices. Um, not everybody used them. We kind of made it an easy opt out. If you don't want to use it, unplug it, stick it in your drawer, turn it in at the end of the year. Uh, but we saw a really good usage. Um, we also saw uh, uh, good feedback. We would send out surveys. We would send out reminder emails uh, to, to help them at different times during the year. So as, uh, as midterms were coming up, we'd send out emails going, hey, did you know Alexa can help you by setting reminders um, or help you by playing meditation music or, or um, getting you connected to different things on campus. Uh, so overall, we, we, we felt like it was a very successful program. The feedback from the students was very positive. What we did get a lot of feedback on was they actually wanted the Alexa devices to do more. So as we started looking to Alexa's next year on campus, in the spring, uh, we were really looking to grow the skills significantly. And fortunately, we were introduced to the uh, open source AWS Q&A chatbot uh, application and a really amazing team from uh, AWS's pro professional services uh, group um, that we partnered with on this. So as part of that, we did a three-week proof of concept to evaluate the chatbot's effectiveness for our program. Um, and after evaluating that, getting student input um, on, on, uh, on how that looked, we were pretty impressed with what it could do. So we undertook an eight-week kind of rapid development partnership to, um, to significantly expand what Alexa did. So as we rolled into this year, with Alexa in the dorms, Alexa had, had dramatic expansion of capabilities. We went from 130 questions to, liter to hundreds of questions. Um, I, I actually couldn't tell you the exact number anymore. Um, I, I, I'm not sure it'd be easy to, to, to even determine at this point. Because we also went and uh, integrated into key backend systems. So our shuttle bus tracking system has an API. You can ask it real time when will the shuttle bus be at Bush Student Center? And it will, it will give you not only the next one, but like the following three as well. So the shuttle bus will be here in 13 minutes. Um, you, it integrates with our athletics uh, uh, system. So you can ask when games will be. Um, you can, it integrates with our food services. So you can ask it, what, um, what are vegan meal options tonight? And so overall, the, the, the 
the expansion has been really dramatic. Um, we feel like it's highly scalable. Uh, we're able to easily add questions. We're able to easily add more information to it. The other uh, component is that we want multimodal. It is no longer restricted to devices in the dorm rooms. You can, you can now uh, have web chat interfaces. And we've seen with our web presence, the sites we put up so far, there have been weeks where up to 30% of the visitors have interacted with the chat bot. You can also text message it too. So if anybody's interested, 314-977-CHAT, you can send text messages to it. It'll text you back with, with information um, and links to information to get, to get uh, uh, kind of deeper content. And then we also made it publicly available. So uh, parents can now download it or non-residential students can now download it, have it on their, their own personal Alexa device or on their app on their smartphone so they can take it with them. Um, we've also, uh, one of the key features too, feedback's really important to us, and I'll talk about that on the next slide, but we added in uh, the ability to give us thumbs up and thumbs down. So we're at, before we kind of had to wait until we'd send out an email, we'd get survey responses, we'd kind of see what they liked. Now it's immediate response. Somebody says thumbs down, we get an email about it. We can see what the question was, they were unhappy with the response, and then decide whether we should actually answer that question or not, or if we're giving a bad response or how we, how we can improve it. So back to the, the kind of higher level approaching innovation differently. Um, so our, our ability to, to do rapid innovation is not just about being quick, right? Um, being quick certainly helps us get stakeholders engaged, help, helps us get attention from leadership at the university, but it's not what really ultimately drives success. So our focus is always around things like productivity, functionality, usability. How do we make it, uh, uh, how do we deliver services that make the university a better experience for our students, for our faculty, for our, our patients, our clinicians, our researchers? So we are always, um, from the start, thinking about that. It is not, you know, we, we like to say IT as a whole, we don't do to them, we do with them or for them. Um, so we, that's really in our DNA of getting people engaged uh, right from the start getting feedback and continuing that process of, of dialogue with them. Um, partnerships are another key, key uh, item for us. We look for strong partnerships like AWS's professional services team uh, to help us rapidly uh, be able to deploy and support these, these initiatives. So what's next for Alexa at SLU? Uh, our big push over the next year is really gonna be around personalization. At this point, all of the information we've provided has been you know, publicly available, but our goal has been to make it quickly publicly available, right? You don't have to open up your phone, open up your computer and search for this information. You're able to get it in seconds by as asking a question. Now we're gonna look at kind of the next steps of how do we, how do we know who you are and how do we provide you um, personalized information in the right venue in secure ways. Thanks. So we're going to pivot into a bit of a panel discussion, and then we will open it up to the audience to ask questions to um, to my to the panelists here, so that you can also participate in the conversation. I'm going to pose three questions, and then we'll turn it over to the broader audience. One of the first questions I'll start with is that in each of your programs, and thank you so much for diving deep and giving us um, a deeper understanding of the work that you're leading. But what's interesting, it gets back to an opening statement that I made, each of you have talked about programmatic or academic programs, you talk about the importance of certifications, and then this idea of the devices and the culture change on your campus. If I'm an institution leader or a faculty leader, how would I know where to get started? Should I start with programs? Should I start with devices? Should I start with integrating in components of the technology? Where would you, how would you guide a faculty member on where to get started with this idea of innovation? I stumped them. Well, um, so the program director, uh, Dr. Christian Hammond, he is um, co-founder uh, of co-founder of, of Narrative Science, and he's a knowledge junkie and robot junkie. So 
um, it really just starts with the students and the student interest. And you know, we had our very first hackathon at orientation where students were introduced to the skills challenge where they all got the Alexas and they made it do something like, Alexa, I have all of this stuff in my refrigerator. What can you make? Tuna casserole would be the answer. So I think that it's really just collaborating and understanding who your students are, where they're coming from, the experience of your faculty, um, and really what's happening out in the world. So we have a fun thing that we say is, take time to look beyond your computer screen to see what's out there in the world and the problems that need to be solved, and the rest just writes itself. Yeah, great. Noah or Kyle? So, um, so we get, uh, we like to have the process be involved in kind of our relationship with them, right? Whether it's faculty members, students, researchers, whoever. Uh, we work really hard to kind of build that foundational relationship, so it's this ongoing conversation. So when we, when we have opportunities come up, we're, we're kind of, we're beyond that step of, of you know, trying to find out their interests. Um, so our, our group, um, the group I work with, we try and stay on top of trends. We go to the Consumer Electronics Show to see kind of what's coming out, and, and, and the Alexa program actually came out of uh, uh, a discussion we'd had, we went to CES, saw all these things that were going on, and we're like, you know, this, this might work here. Um, but but we, we try and have an ongoing discussion with, you know, not only our deans, but our faculty members, our clinicians, our researchers, so that we're able to help them connect to new ideas. Um, we've, we've done that many times. We, did a, we had a, a radiologist who was doing 3D printing, and so he'd take CT scans and create 3D models of them and, and print them out, which is great for uh, operative planning for like elective surgeries. But for for uh, trauma cases, it was way too long. It, you know, it could take days to print that image. And so, in in a discussion with him about you know 3D printing, we were also working on VR technology and just kind of looking at it. And and we brought the idea to him of. What, would you be interested? Would it even be valuable? Because I'm sorry, I'm not a clinician, right? I don't know. I'm not a. I'm not a doctor. Would a virtual reality re representation be valuable? And he got really excited about that. And we brought in a partner who had some experience with this. And we basically created a VR program that could ingest a CT or an MRI scan and build out a 3D model that they could then go into and manipulate. And so a lot of it really is behind having those kind of an ongoing relationship and, and, and a, a trust relationship so those ideas come up and can be, you know, can be kicked around. Yeah. Oh, please, go ahead. Yeah, I would say my, a lot of the programs I'm teaching in, it's, it's very um, uh, career-focused. And so the students are, are basically uh, motivated in getting a degree to get a better job. And for me, that's a really simple way to, to get started with AWS is that if you give someone AWS skills, they're going to get a better job that has higher salary and a quicker placement rate. So to me, it's just very um, data driven is that's why you should be, you know, introducing AWS on your, on your campus. That's why, you know, university I'm working with, they're in fact even paying money for students to get the certifications and like reimbursing them. So like it, it, it's the, the data is so strong for for these skills that uh, it's once you expose this to your organization, then all of a sudden everyone goes, "Oh, okay, now I understand." Yeah. What's interesting is uh, something that I that came to mind as I listened to each of you talk about your programs. There is a great, a very strong emphasis on the student, and either the student as the recipient of that innovation or the student as an input to that innovation. I'm curious, how do you involve and engage faculty? What's the role that faculty need to play, whether it's influencing or informing the innovation, or they themselves staying in step with the innovation? What's, what, how would you talk about the role of the faculty? So, so, so I'd say it's <laughs> critical, I right? Um, we, you know, I, I know because of the program I was talking about, it was heavily student-focused, right? But, but we, get in, we get faculty involved at all levels. Um, I'll go back to the VR example, right? We, in, in conjunction with our, our student government association, we built out a, a room in the library that's focused on VR, right? And we have, a, we have a faculty member who is in Italian foreign languages, just brilliant. And he, he is on the leading edge of video gaming um, and using video gaming in education. And so 
in having these discussions and conversations with him, you know, I was able to connect him to the VR space as well. So he uses, uh, he uses Assassin's Creed in his Italian language classes because the students can go in and play it in Italian. And he's shown, uh, you know, a dramatic uh, or a significant in, uh, increase in their, their adoption and strength of language skills through playing these games. And they get exposed to, you know, historic Italian culture and probably some other things that he may not, you know, or incidental side effects. Uh, but, but in talking to him about the VR space, he was, he's, uh, we've got a meeting actually next week. The room just came online. He's going to go in and take a look at that and see how he can use that in his, in his courses. Mm -hmm. So I go back to, I mean, to, to us, the faculty members are really critical. And it's, you know, it's not just about getting the information out there, it's about having those conversations to help them connect what the opportunities are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for AI students, um, our students actually seek out the faculty based on their interest area. So uh, if it's robotics or computer vision, our students actually gravitate toward those experts because, you know, our, our faculty are majority researchers. Uh, we do have some that are re researchers and practitioners. So our students actually find them, and that's one of the things that we encourage them to do. You don't have to know what you want to do as soon as you join the program, uh, because your lens starts to sharpen as you start to learn and see and grow. But a lot of the times our students, um, it, on our website, it's email Shanika, because we, we encourage students to go directly to the faculty if there's an interest area that you have. So our faculty, they welcome that outreach. So we make sure that students know that it's all driven by the collaboration. I would also add that I think it's important when, when, like if I tell a student, you need to get AWS certified, it's good for your career, you know, and, and then I don't have that, it doesn't look good, right? I don't have the credibility. So I think that's a big one is that I would say in the faculty perspective that if you're the, the person teaching the material, lead by example and show what it is that someone should do. And then they, I found like there's a lot of credibility when you do what you say someone else should do. So I'm gonna, my, and my final question before we open it up to the audience, um, I'm gonna ask probably a question that I shouldn't ask at a technology, one of our leading cloud computing conferences. Um, is innovation solely about technology? Because we've solely talked about technology today, but is innovation? I, I don't think so. I, I think, more than technology. <laughs> no, I, I think it's a conduit to it. But I think that there, there has to be an idea, a need, a use case um, to be able to apply the technology to fix whatever problem that requires some sort of solution. So I don't think it's all encompassing, but it's, it's a huge conduit to, to making sure that you can solve a problem. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think it's, it's a tool and it's, right now, it's a very effective tool, right? We, we, we have so much going on and, and so many new things coming out. You know, we've all been at this conference, and we're, we're seeing some of the really cool stuff that's that's either just come out or or has come out recently. And so, it's there's so much going on there. there it, it breeds a lot of opportunity, but it certainly is not solely about technology. Well, uh, one of my professors at UC Davis, uh, he when I was getting an MBA, he had a great class on on innovation. He leads the innovation center there, so I'll just copy what you know I, I learned from him was that. If you look at you know, lots of different successful people in history, there was this myth that there's a person that just is a genius and they come up with it. They had a community of people, they took ideas. They, they, if they didn't have that community of people, they're not gonna get to the level they're at. So, so that's been my experience with, with um, technology is that the only reason I got anywhere that I got was because people were helping me, I was in a community, you know, I learned stuff from that community. So if the technology kind of accidentally makes that happen, then great, but I, I don't think they're actually that related in a way. It's, it's To me, it's the community uh, and the exchanging of ideas that leads to innovation, and the technology is just a byproduct. Yeah. Perfect. So now it's your turn. We're gonna open it up for questions uh, from the audience. We're gonna ask that you use your outside voice, and then I'll repeat <laughs> the question back uh, as part of our recording. So don't be shy. We, we'd welcome questions from the audience, please. Please stand and nice and loud. The gentleman in the rear. Great question. So the question is, is what have you seen specific to high school students in relation to the technology and innovation? We, um, so we've definitely met with a lot of high schools in our area. 
and you know brought them in to see what we're doing and and you know and have those kind of ongoing conversations so I, I think high schools are definitely you know many are definitely really thinking along those lines of how do they get them prepared how do they how do they um, you know expose them to different technologies and I, from what I've been seeing, it's it's been really exciting. Some of the things the the high school programs are doing. Now, I, I would say that what what I think would be an interesting societal change is that you make it okay that you're in high school and you get a skill that's a professional skill. Like I accidentally got I, I my dad had a company was a, a television production company, and I accidentally learned how to edit and I got a job professionally when I was in high school, and it just like a bulb hit where I was like, wow, wow I, can, I can like make money. You know? and, and I think there's really important if, if someone <coughs> feels like they can, they can survive on their own, then they have that freedom where, where maybe if they, they, they then later go on to college, they've got this, they've got this like very different perspective about why they're in school. So I, I personally think it would be great if students were um, able to get professional skills even before they graduate and they can work while they're in school or not work, but that, that's an option for them. Absolutely, and, and in response to that, more and more what we're finding, specifically with the AWS Educate program, is that institution partners, both community colleges as well as four-year institutions, more and more are creating articulation agreements with high schools in their local regions, where they're actually building dual enrollment programs that allow students to leave and graduate high school with an associate's degree. We've actually built specifically with Santa Monica College, with Nova Community College, dual enrollment programs that are focused specifically on cloud computing. And we're seeing more and more adoption of that globally, even outside of the US. So we're seeing more and more of that in, in particular because of the dual enrollment opportunity or early college programs that are existing more and more in, in the high school programs. Terrific question. I saw another hand. The gentleman here in the yellow, please. Great question. So the question was, with your use of AWS, was the implementation a centralized implementation, or did your specific colleges um, or departments own that implementation and roll out of AWS? That is a great question. The thing about higher education is the left hand often doesn't know what the right hand is doing. So you have, like at Northwestern, we have 12 separate schools, and we're very decentralized. Um, I created a relationship with AWS, not created, but the outreach. Then I found later that they have a relationship at a different, a different school. So what we're doing now is we're trying to collaborate so we can have hackathons with everybody. So it's very decentralized. I, I, I've, I've, you know, people that have known me have known, I've put like the shadow in shadow IT my whole career. So I've, I've always been the person who was like, there's something somewhere I'm like, uh, it's, I think we could do a little bit better over yeah. here. And so I, that, that has actually worked really well in education. I, I think that the, it's better to just ask for forgiveness and mm -hmm. just go in, set it up, and then later it, it, people are like, oh yeah, that was a good idea, thank right. you. Right. So, so we actually have a, a highly centralized IT department. Um, we, that was part of kind of our, our change over the last three years. But even before that, we had a more centralized than a lot of, a lot of universities have. Um, so it, it's definitely been more of a centralized effort for us, but there are, def there are schools that have adopted it and, and we work with them to help them, you know, make sure they've got the right access. And, and again, our, our job is to kind of lower the barrier to entry so they can, you know, spend their, their time more on what cool things can we do with it rather than how do I jump through the hoops of getting it set up. But I'd like to add, just really, no, really quickly, and the reason it's decentralized is because often the left hand doesn't want to let the right hand know what they're doing. <laughs> so they're like, no. <laughs> I would just echo what my colleagues have, shifts, have indicated. We've seen both sets of implementations, uh, really from our vantage point, as we support the work that institutions want to do. We want to help them to move fast. And so if we find that there's an early adopter in a school that wants to move, yes. But if we can get that broader institution implementation, it does reap other benefits.
because each school can gain the benefits of the work that's happening with faculty. There's some faculty in other parts of the institution that have a deeper understanding of the technology. They can help train these other institutions. So we work hard to try to support wherever that institution is on that spectrum of adoption. So, but we've seen great use cases in both. Please, the gentleman in front, thank you. IOT. Great. So the question is, what of these institutions that are here with us, what are, what insti what are institutions finding are the degrees that are adopting the AWS implementation, whether it's machine learning, data science, big data, IoT, what degrees are adopting that AWS implementation? For us right now, it's the artificial intelligence program, but also the analytics program. Yeah, I've seen that. I had to, I basically was like, just like ramming the cloud into programs I taught at machine learning and, and data science. And then all of a sudden, it, just recently, it was like everyone's like coming back now and they're like, you need to teach cloud classes. And, and, but then what I noticed is that the, the, the graduate programs like MSBAs, there's also the MBA. And MBA enrollment has actually been really hammered. And I've noticed that a lot of the MBA students have, have been asking about cloud skills. So I think that's probably one of the hotter areas right now is if you, especially if you look at things like AutoML and like, you know, off the shelf, you know, AWS Comprehend, I, personally, I think that should be in every single MBA program as you teach people how to do ML and AI without writing code. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it should be just like Excel. And to piggyback, MBA and computer science degrees. So before that I know. We're, we're seeing actually a really wide scale, right? So. We definitely have like you know cybersecurity, AI, um, you know the, the the engineering programs, um, uh, autonomous vehicles, things like that. But but we're also seeing even adoption in like our public health, where where they're they're buying in and, and are really excited about the the data analytics that can come in and the power of a lot of these tools. Perfect. Uh, absolutely. Please. I, I mean, that's, that's basically I'm the, sorry, who I no, teach. let me repeat oh, the question oh, sorry. really quickly, okay. no worries. Okay. So the question posed is, for individuals who are coming into the education pipeline through the non-traditional route, so whether not, not coming in through as a high school student or a, a freshman, but those who may be coming out of career switchers or maybe military or any alternative path where they may have professional experience, how are you finding their transition and are your programs adapt, adapting for those coming through those kinds of pipelines. Yeah, and so what I was gonna say is that, uh, real quickly, is that that's basically who I teach is, is those kind of students. Okay. And what I've noticed is that, that, that's why I said the triple threat is that degree, portfolio, certification, that's what I encourage every working professional to do. And it, I think it's a very effective strategy based on what I've observed. I think with the AI program, it, it's such a technical, hands-on, non-theory-based program that everyone starts on equal, equal footing. If you know what you know and you know it, then you use what you know and you do it. So there's, we haven't experienced, and granted, this is our second cohort, our second year that the program has been in existence, and we've seen new undergrads that have transitioned into grad school. We've seen folks leave their career after nine years and come back to get a master's degree, and they're starting on equal footing because it's a technology-based program that's extremely heavy and hands-on and practical applied to where they're learning in the classroom and then they're doing it for their client or their partner. So they start with equal footing. And I would say what we've been finding with AWS Educate is that institutions are <coughs> adapting and adjusting for that student pipeline. So for example, I mentioned Nova Community College earlier. They have a specific apprentice boot camp program solely focused on military. 
because they bring a different set of skills in, their, their starting point is very different, and they can help them to focus really in on the skills that where there's the gaps, like Linux. Um, we're also finding that programs are in fact making some adjustments for individuals that have that professional experience, right? So, because they, could, they have the business application understanding, now we have to apply that technical component. And so programs are making adjustments. Uh, we've seen programs that have a professional certification side versus the full credit bearing undergraduate two year, four year, or the graduate program. So I think it just depends on the institution and the students that they serve where we're finding that programs are making the adjustments. And I think that's right, for sure. Please, of course. The, the lady in the back and then I'll come to you, please. Yeah. I have an opinion here. <laughs> yeah. So the question piggybacked on that earlier comment, specifically, how are institutions specifically addressing the needs of those who are coming that may already have an MBA program, MBA for example, and they've been in the work in their work profession for 15 years? How are programs adapting and, and responding? Um, I would say, I kind of double click the answer. In, institutions recognize that they're serving a range of students today. And to be relevant, to be competitive, to ensure that they're meeting the market conditions of their region, they have to adjust their programs. And so we, we through Educate, have more and more heard from institutions help us to build more specialized, unique certifications or programs that allow them to accelerate because the student base that they're serving bring a different set of skills than a traditional student coming through from a high school graduate, graduate an 18-year-old. I don't know if any of my colleagues would add, please. Yeah, I, I, this is something I really particularly passionate about that your question is that I think that there is this place to carve out the degree and to pull out into these like nano degrees or and, and I personally I think that there should be a, a lifelong learning process for most people where you just say okay here's what I'm gonna learn this year is what I'm gonna learn next year and you just you just constantly doing it so it's this idea that you can just learn this degree and then that's it I think is that day is over I think it's that every year what are you gonna learn and how are you gonna get it and who's gonna sell it? Maybe some people are gonna sell a SAS subscription. Sometimes you're gonna buy a, you know, a nano degree from like Udacity. But I, I think the education is gonna get unbundled and that a lot of this, these little pieces you can buy and that hopefully smart companies uh, are gonna actually encourage uh, and actually enhance the employee's ability to stay relevant. And I think that's a big, I th right. yeah, right. I think it's a big mistake. Right, for well, sure. Well, we're a part of the mistake, unfortunately. Um, I hate to say that. Noah and I are both at the same university, um, and our segments are very different. So Noah teaches in the analytics, is it analytics or? The, the, the um, data science program. In the data yeah. science program. Um, and I'm in the artificial intelligence program, but we attract people right out of undergrad. Um, or a few years out, of, out into the workforce. So our average age for students is 27 years old, while Noah's average age of students might be 35 years old. So in his part-time, his program is part-time, and I think mm -hmm. it's offered online. Yeah. Mine is full-time, daytime only. No, not, no online, no part-time, no hybrid. Quit your life, Monday through Friday, nine to five. So we're never going to go in the direction of the adult learning, which is the largest population of learners which are people like us that want to continue our education, but unfortunately, we're stuck in the traditional graduate school mind set. And sadly, we have to end on that note. <laughs> this has been a fantastic discussion. I saw your hand. We're going to step off and are happy to engage and, and respond to your question. You all have been tremendously, wonderfully engaged audience. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank so much to my panelists, Kim, Noah, and Kyle. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.